very good morning to you all. Hello, everyone. Let's make some noise. It's a Friday. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, let's make some noise for Friday. Okay. I hope you've had an amazing industry week. It is our final day of industry week, and we are going out with a number of bangs. So, first things first, remember, can I see a show of hands? How many of you have been getting your post on, getting your tweet on? Let me see some hands. You've been getting that hashtag IW2020, IW22 going on, right? Some people have been posting, but without the hashtag, what use is that? Repost the exact same thing again, right? Okay, anyway, all that aside. Folks, I'm not going to give you the fire talk because you know what we need to do in the event of a fire. But we're about to have some fire in the booth right now with the next lecture. That's an amazing joke, right? <laughs> Excellent stuff. Okay, folks, so introducing our two guests from one of the biggest esports orgs in the world, Face It, Reese and Simon. Take it away, guys. Cheers. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us at 10 a.m. Uh, on a Friday. I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, and yeah, just thanks for, if you plan on coming yesterday, for making the switch to today. Um, as a, just as a request before we actually get into the presentation, if you have any questions or if you feel like there's something that pops into your mind, like as we're talking about something, make a note of it. If it's not rude if you get your phone out and just make a note so you can ask us at the end. We'll hold a long Q&A, so that's, that's great. Um, so my name is Simon. Smack that on the chest. And this is Reese. Um, and it turns out that uh, as I'm about to talk uh, about being a producer and being exceptionally organized. I happened to fail at the core part of my job, which was uh, you know, organizing an appearance on the right day at the right time. Uh, so that's, that's a good start. Um, anyway, Reese is going to talk about Face It and kind of what the company is. So I'm sure many of you know who Face It is. You may have played on the platform, but it's always good to never assume. It's one of the things I learned very early in my career is don't make assumptions because assumptions can break a broadcast. So Face It started back in 2012, initially started um, a team that had no experience, a little bit of seed money. We started in Quake and Counter-Strike doing online leagues. Eventually that led up to doing LAN events. We did our first LAN event in Milan in 2014 and that was actually the first LAN event I ever did. The company continued to grow and so did our our kind of state, status with the industry. Uh, we're now the biggest gaming platform in the world. We have done events all over the world, within Europe, within Asia, within North America. We've done majors in many titles and uh, just recently merged with ESL to become the biggest gaming company within esports. So I'm gonna hand over to Simon, who's gonna talk through his journey on how he became a producer. Sorry, I'll play that, play that after my intro. Um, so again, like I said, I'm a broadcast producer, um, but what that means in the context of work in, in this industry and at Face It, it, it varies greatly. Um, essentially, you would think that it looks a lot like this and you know, working in galleries like this, but in COVID, it's actually looked a lot more like this as a home studio and this as a tiny little setup at uh, Epic Land and Kettering and vmix shows like this um, with that in mind i think that my experience is uniquely relevant to you guys as students um, i graduated in may of 2020 um, and i think we live in a world now where remote broadcasts and live events go hand in hand um, so i'm going to take you briefly through my experience and some stories uh, kind of behind my journey um, so uh, as many of us, if not most of us, in esports broadcast, uh, I'm a gamer, uh, and at uni I played a lot of Rainbow Six and CS:GO. That was my my like obsession. Uh, I'd been to a couple of like really small esports events, but I'd never actually been to uh, like a big stadium event or any of the stuff that you have access to in in Europe. Um, so my first one was as a tiny event in South Africa, uh, where I'm from, uh, and I realized that putting on the events and all of the behind the scenes of those events is kind of where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. So uh, to kind of achieve that goal, and I had no idea what that goal would eventually lead to, I consumed a, a ridiculous amount of CSGO and Rainbow Six Pro League VODs to have an understanding of what the pros are doing and where I would eventually need to be if I wanted to succeed in this industry. Um, my, my first 
actual live event broadcast began um, kind of pre-COVID, so in 2019. Um, but all of my professional shows are mid-pandemic. Um, and my first one was actually Flashpoint 2, uh, which was the first broadcast that happened during the pandemic with the studio participation of talent and crew. Uh, we hosted a 42-person bubble in Twickenham Stadium, and we stayed there for eight weeks. Uh, we didn't go outside. We didn't get a break. Um, we weren't allowed to leave at all other than like the smokers could have a smoke break in front of the hotel and we could have a walk around the inner uh, circle of the stadium but we weren't allowed any interaction with people that weren't in the bubble um, even the the kitchen staff and other twickenham staff had to stay well away from us we had a, a green badge for those that were in the bubble and a red badge from out and if we mixed we'd have to isolate and miss the show um, i came on as a as a producer so i'd just been hired and um I was supposed to be a broadcast engineer, which is about the vaguest description of what I could do. Um, so I was helping my boss set up fiber, optic cabling, and networking, um, running stuff for talent as a runner, um, and then basically being a production assistant to Reese uh, on the show and kind of doing anything I could to make sure that the broadcast ran smoothly and the, the team of experienced directors and producers had what they needed. What eventually ended up happening, though, is that the entire audio and networking team got COVID and had to isolate in their rooms. Uh, so I was kind of transitioned from a broadcast engineer who had literally no experience in any audio, any video engineering, uh, or working with any talent in live space to having to basically talent and stage manage, uh, do all of the video and audio engineering stuff that couldn't be done from their rooms. Um, and it, it gave me about the quickest learning curve I've ever had in my life. Uh, and I, I guess I have COVID to thank for that because that never would have happened without it. But it was also uh, one of the first times that I was shouted at by a couple of members of talent because they weren't happy with what I was doing. And that's, that was a, you know, a good learning experience for me. Um, but again, to bring it back to storytelling and kind of executing the narrative in esports, um, how I got into this really was kind of fluke. I was looking for a job at uni uh, instead of working in a bar or going out and doing some random like handiwork or in delivery driving. I wanted to do something that I was passionate about and that I loved and not to take away from any of those jobs because you've got to do what you've got to do to make ends meet. But um, I looked on Hitmarker and Discord and a whole bunch of other random places to try and find work in esports, and all of it was volunteer. Nobody wanted to pay you for any entry level stuff, and I'm sure if any of you have tried to find jobs, that's the biggest hurdle in overcoming. Um, but I did it anyway. I kind of relied on my parents to help me get by, and not everybody has that opportunity, so I'm very grateful. Um, but I learned from a bunch of people very quickly that uh, if you want to make things happen as a as an early graduate or as someone that's just starting in the industry, you basically have to take it upon yourself to do whatever's necessary to make that show go live. Um, and I had to tell myself, how would I like to see the broadcast come out? How would I like information, statistics, graphics, content to come out of the show? And if I didn't like what I was seeing, I took it upon myself to say, if you don't like it, you haven't worked hard enough, you haven't put in enough time, either with the team that's doing it, so editors and talent, or on my own time when I didn't have graphics designers and people putting a broadcast package together, I had to do it in OBS with YouTube tutorials. Um, and I had no Photoshop experience, no Premiere experience, none of that. So it's just, it all came from free tutorials and then basically asking people, hey, does this look good? Does this tell you what you need? Um, I, had, I kind of relied heavily on people in the the kind of sphere, so the talent and people that were running, like at CCS, that were running tournaments, um, to tell me, yeah, that looks awful, or no, that's that's awesome, but can a trans transition go here? I think there's way too much text on the page, stuff like that. Um, and ultimately, I learned that the, my most important lesson was communication is everything. Uh, without communicating to your team or to the people that you're trying to interact with, so your audience, your fans, uh, if you're not communicating effectively, the show has no purpose. And storytelling is all about communication. Um, 
yeah, and then basically my experience boils down to a lot of, a lot of trying things out, uh, breaking a lot of things, breaking graphics, breaking software packages, having VMix and OBS crash on me often during live shows, uh, missing cues, which talent would then come out in the break and shout at me for saying, dude, you didn't cue me, you just threw up a video, you just like threw a transition at us. Um, and without that experience, and, and ultimately this is what I'm gonna repeat over and over again, without trying those things and failing, uh, you'll never learn. Um, and on the other side of that, almost every time I've been complimented about the work that I've done, uh, it's just been about how I've communicated a plan, communicated a strategy, and communicated what's coming up. Even if it's literally, hey guys, in 30 seconds, there's a video that's gonna come up, it's gonna last two minutes. And they talk through that. Without that information, they can't convey the story or convey a smooth pathway to an audience about where this broadcast is going. Uh, and yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. So I'm gonna give over to Reese and he's gonna give you a little bit of a story about the earlier <laughs> days of broadcast and how he got started. Cool, so while Simon's journey may be, replica, rec uh, maybe something you guys can replicate, mine probably isn't, but I'll still talk you through because most people in esports have a pretty insane journey of, of how they got here. So my journey started all the way back in the olden days of 2010. I went to university, I had a brief career as a player, but I had to stop so I could focus on study. I then moved into team managing, which at that time the hot new game was StarCraft 2, so that was the game I focused on. I worked for some teams like Team Infused, Western Wolves and Mouse Sports, and I spent my university weekends traveling around Europe, America, and I lived in Korea for a summer managing the players that I was in charge of. I graduated uh, with a degree in psychology and I struggled to find a job because I, other than doing the eSports stuff, I hadn't volunteered, I hadn't put in any work to learn any skills that were gonna get me employed. So I ended up working in a call center. Um, during that time though, I, I wasn't prepared to give up on eSports. Back then, there wasn't that many people making a full-time living and a lot of the people who did were kind of bandits who were stealing a bunch of money and disappearing. Um, I, me and a few friends tried to make our own competitive FBI, FPS title called Project Next, which we thought was gonna be the biggest thing, the next Counter-Strike, but we ran out of money in six months and it went nowhere. But within that time, I made connections with a new company called Faceit, who were trying to put their platform into our game as a matchmaking system. When the project died, I reached out and I asked if they have any jobs. They hadn't advertised anything. I knew they didn't have much money, but I, I took a punt and I, I just asked. Because if you don't ask, you don't get. And I did get. They offered me a job as an esports assistant, making 600 pounds a month. So I quit my job in the call center, uh, moved from the town I was in, and I slept on sofas for a while. Um, I couldn't afford rent in London, so I, I slept on a sofa Monday to Friday, and then on the weekend I went back to my parents uh, up in Yorkshire, and I, I did that for about, about six to nine months. Um, we did 18 hour broadcasts back then, Europe, then North America. So kind of killed myself for six months, made no money, but I enjoyed it and I have a lot of good memories from that time. Following that, I got a slight increase so I could move full time to London, um, and, then, and, and then things started to progress. But during this time, I wasn't actually working as an eSport assistant. I turned up day one of work to meet the team. We went out for ramen, etc. but I walked into the COO, uh, Michele Atasani, and the producer at the time, James Bardolf, having an argument because James Bardolf had just done his first casting and wanted to become a caster instead of a producer. They asked, you know, who's gonna do it? And James pointed to me and said, what about that guy? And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, within 24 hours, I was running a broadcast for 70,000 unique viewers, which was the Face It League. Uh, I, was not, I was meant to shout over two weeks, but the CEO um, ended up falling asleep, so I had to take over mid-broadcast. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of fat fingering, hard cuts, and the show back then is virtually unwatchable by today's standard, but I learned on the job, and I had to do what I had to do, and I got the skills by just doing what was needed. Throughout the years, I've kind of grown with the company. I started from a tiny little studio that's the size of this stage, uh, and then 
within three years, I was working with ESPN, Turner, and NBC. I moved to LA, and I, I lived in LA and ran our shows from there. In the past, since 2014, I've probably taken about 100, 120 flights around the world. I skipped many steps that I would have had to take if I worked in traditional media. And when I have meetings with TV executives, most peers in the room are about 60. So eSports gives you an opportunity that traditional media wouldn't in that in traditional media, it's about who you know. In eSports, it's about what you can do. If you can demonstrate you can do something, you have a passion, you have a drive, then you're going to get it. Someone's going to take a punt on you. I worked myself into a senior position. That means now I'm heavily involved in staffing and crewing events. So I kind of wanted to focus on, on what we look for and what are the things to avoid or the things to try and do to market yourself if you're trying to get that job in eSports. I'd say the first, the first thing is attitude and first impression. What you know is important, but how you come across is way more important. We'd much rather hire someone that doesn't know what they're doing, but has a willingness to learn, has a good attitude, and is kind of fun to work with. If you fit into the team, you're going to last long term. We can teach you what you don't know. Someone that comes in with a chip on their shoulder, some arrogance because they've got a little bit of success, which we have seen quite a lot recently, those people don't last because their arrogance leads to mistakes. They think they know more than they do and they'll end up becoming a bottleneck that causes problems for the entire team. So just being open, willing to learn, and a fun person to be with is going to take you quite far in the industry. Being able to perform under pressure is the key skill of, of being a producer. There's some people that I've worked with that are incredible. They know what they're doing. They're so organized. But when it hits the fan, they crumble, and they can't be relied on. And that's something that just can't happen. You need to be great at problem solving. You need to have amazing time management. And you need to have that willingness to learn and that acceptance that not everyone knows, any, not everyone knows everything. You, you need to be able to say that, I don't know this. Someone needs to help me, rather than keeping it to yourself and leaving it to the last possible minute, which causes huge issues. You need to be creative and have an ability to see something that isn't already there. How can you bring some skills to the table that elevates something from a good product to a great product? You need to be able to come in and see, can this simple graphic elevate the show? What about this? the stats we're showing? Is there other stats we could show that are more interesting and tell more of a story? Or potentially huge changes like the stage doesn't work because of these reasons. You need to use your game knowledge and your ability and passion to be able to elevate the product. However, above all else, there's something that will actually get you fired for face, at face it for uttering, and it's to never say that is not my job. I've run CS events with the CEO and head of marketing as my admins because we had so many events running at the same time back in the day. It's not uncommon to see senior staff members and junior staff members working together on a variety of products. Our director of broadcasting might be carrying food orders because we're so overworked or our office manager might be carrying a box of equipment to the storage facility. You've got to be open to anything and never say no. People aren't going to take advantage, but if you, if you never say, that's not my job, you'll end up learning a lot more skills that you wouldn't if you kept yourself closed off. One of our best hires over the past couple of years has been Simon. He's, he's shown that ability to learn everything and go with the flow. And he's, very, he's elevated himself so quickly within the company. So I'm going to hand it over, and he's going to talk through how that process was and, and how the last three years have gone for Simon with Faceit. I think it's very kind to say that I've been one of the best hires, because there's probably people that have got a lot more done uh, than me in the last couple of years. But um, like Rhys said, I, I think that the industry is evolving in, into a place where um, not everything is going to be a, a 12 hour, 16 hour broadcast and we're, we're slowly moving away from that, which is great. And the pay, the pay has gone up to a point where you can make a, a decent living um, and you feel a great sense of accomplishment with the shows that you can put out without feeling like you are killing yourself to make them happen, uh, which is really nice. Um, but again, with the advent of COVID, live events went away, right, for a long time. So remote events have made, made it feel like we've had to um, really pull stuff out of the bag to find creative solutions in making remote broadcasts work. Uh, anyway, so how did I specifically get a job at Faceit? Um, 
with all of the volunteering, which then led to some other broadcasts, so I'm, I'm sure that some of you have heard of like the, the Newell, the NSE, um, I started out, those were my first paid gigs, um, something like 30, 30 quid for a day. Um, but it really gave me a sense of responsibility that wasn't a broadcast that I was putting out myself for myself. Uh, there was a director that was looking for a quality standard. There was a small but consistent viewership that were vocal about what they wanted to see. Um, I started out on their Rainbow Six broadcasts, which were pretty tiny viewership, and then did a few of their CSGO ones, which had more. Um, from there, I got some freelance work with Red Bull and Ubisoft. So Red Bull had me do, uh, they were trying to get into Rainbow Six, so they did this Red Bull Gaming Sphere tournament. Um, and I got to work with uh, Jess, Jess Goat, and Ace of Pyro and stuff on that, which was great. Um, and then uh, I started doing the, the Ubisoft stuff. So I did the Challenger League for uh, Europe, and we split it with the, their Benelux team. So I was working with a whole bunch of really funny Dutch guys on a weekly basis to try and put out a show with no budget and basically no help on the graphic side of things. And we turned it from a uh, caster-led home broadcast where they did the observing, the casting, and their own streams to a professionally run show that was fully remote but looked like it could meet uh, esports standards that CSGO and other titles were kind of finally pushing out. Um, and luckily, I met and made good relationships with the talent that I worked with. And this, this goes for everybody, for audio engineers, directors, producers, graphic designers. If you have a good relationship with the team that you work with, hopefully they'll help bring you up and, and bring you onto other shows. Because uh, what we find is that we'd much rather work with someone again and again and again if they are reliable and friendly and are willing to put in the effort when, when needed over someone that may be more qualified necessarily, but they're not known to us and they're not known to be a reliable, easy to work with person. Uh, so yeah, I got given uh, a call by our boss, Andy, about a week after I graduated when I was thinking, damn, well, like I need, I need to work, like I need to start applying for jobs. And everyone else was going through the like hundreds of application cycle, which I'm sure a lot of you will have to do. Um, but because of those, those experiences that I'd had, I had contacts and someone had told Andy about me. Um, they got me to do the first Rainbow Six show that Face It had done, uh, which was the EU Open Clash. Uh, where Reese basically had to show me how to use the whole setup that they'd had um, online and that they'd basically just moved to a couple of months before. Um, and I took that in my stride, listened a lot to what Reese had to say and basically, uh, yeah, cultivated that relationship so that I could come back. I worked on a contract for them for about three months and then there was, uh, there was space open for me and again, because I wasn't arrogant, I was willing to learn, uh, I got offered a job and it's, I think the biggest motivating factor that is just a sense of drive and a willingness to try and learn something. So Googling YouTube tutorials, asking a whole bunch of people before you go to your boss or whoever needs something from you and saying, listen, I don't know how to do this. You're going to need to get someone else or you need to teach me. Um, it, doing that will set you apart from your competition. And that's ultimately probably what got me hired. Um, so to go away from our personal stories and kind of the employability of things, we're going to talk to you about storytelling, and Reese is going to take that next step. Does it start with the video? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, going to start with, we've got a couple of videos to show, and... Um, do you want to do Freya's skit as uh, the, or ECS? Just, uh, ECS is before. I don't have it up, actually. I'll just do this, I'll do Freya's skit, and we can talk okay. about it, and you can talk about ECS. Okay, fine. So yeah, this is one of our skits that we did from Flashpoint. If you haven't watched it, uh, Flashpoint was a pretty casual show. Uh, it had a wicked sense of humor. It had people like Freya and Thorin and Sam and Anders that worked on it from CSGO. And they're, they're all fantastic people in terms of content creation. And they're super professional. But this is one of the first skits that we did at Flashpoint 2. live from the Flashpoint News Network. ESL announces new hyperbolic time chamber. Events can now stand up to 40 hours per day. And in financial news, there are fears for renowned color commentator Henry G as Bitcoin prices plummet. We've lost millions in this game, announces Cloud9's Jack Etienne after their $6 million investment. 
And in other news, Dignitas has took time out of their busy schedules to visit a local orphanage. It was just so heartbreaking. Looking into their sad little eyes, there was no hope for them, said Billy, age nine. As pressure mounts from the Brazilian community, the case of banned player DSM is revisited. Ralph issued the following statement. We will not be unbanning either. Warning, zombie outbreak as former Dignitas, NIP and Fanatic player exist, rises from the dead to terrorise the lands with his loose style of in-game leading. That's all from us at the Flashpoint News Network. We'll see you next time. Do the other one? Yeah. And then one of the, our, our favorite piece from Flashpoint 2 probably is this piece from Potter. It wasn't pretty, the side of MIBI in this world. 16 to two, that is such a brutal scoreline. It is, it is, but you know, it's again, one of those things where a team like MIBI are so fresh, so new, that experience, that butt wrecking that they just got. Butt wrecking, wondering how I got myself into this situation. It isn't easy thinking up creative descriptions on the fly. So here's how I got myself into this butt-wrecking mess. Shit. I need the audience to understand just how badly MIBR got on. Quick, Christy. Come on. Think of something funny. Got their asses kicked. No, no, no. Too boring. Too boring. Maybe I can work this ass angle though. Call it a cartage. No, it's too graphic. That, that would make the Brazilians real mad. Rectal ruin. It's a nice alliteration, but it's a little too technical. Anal devastation. I'll get to it. A little too extreme for me. I'll have Thor tweet that one out later. I'll, I'll take over. Ooh. And like we are so fresh, so new, that experience, that butt wrecking that they just got. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> so, from trying to overcome something, a weakness we have. <laughs> Not me. Playing a video. No? Yeah. Sorry guys. So with Flashpoint 2, obviously we were stuck inside of a hotel. The event was meant to have a huge crowd, it was meant to have a stadium feel, that epicness. We couldn't have that because of COVID, so we had to be creative and come up with something else. To do that, we decided to heavily focus on allowing the talent to get their creativity out and to show what they can. We, we had a film crew, we had con uh, constant meetings to come up with ideas. Each day started with an opener like that, uh, comedic cold open. And then we had uh, interviews, we had special pieces throughout the show to make the event feel different because we knew we were coming in from a deficit and the event needed to stand out. So it wasn't just a regular COVID event. We did the same thing in ECS season four. I had a piece, but uh, I won't show you. We were back in 2017, uh, we were in a Cancun resort and obviously, it's in Mexico, we, we hadn't got a crowd. All of our competitors right then were having huge stadium events. So we did, the, we did the same thing. And we had every piece of content become a narrative piece that when you edited them out, became a 30 minute episode of Pala getting stranded on a desert island that you could watch regardless of the Counter-Strike content. So you gotta take what, what would be seen as a negative of the event and turn it to your advantage and using storytelling methods like content pieces is a great way to do that. What comes next? So whether you view it as an art, a science, storytelling takes the, w the work of so many voices, literally and figuratively. Beyond getting just a show on air and providing the bare minimum for viewers, a few things to telling an esports story well include the right talent, the right graphics, the right replay or highlights, a good schedule that works for the viewers and has communicated well, the correct marketing and PR, and making sure the tone of the show you're putting on matches what you're trying to say. So I want to give two examples of how we use storytelling to elevate a product and make it work. Uh, the first one was back in 2017. So the game Overwatch had just come out, and uh, I was tasked with coming up with broadcasting the first Overwatch event, which was the Overwatch Open with Face It in NBC. 
So Overwatch is borderline unwatchable. Um, so we had to <laughs> we had to try to come up with a way of, of making it digestible for the viewer. Um, so I had two observers, uh, Sliggy, who is now Team Liquid's Valorant coach, and Jackie, who's a, now a commentator who you guys saw a few days ago. We were tasked with making the game and, and making it watchable. To do that, we came up with a bunch of rules, a bunch of, of views. We used a lot of third-person view and had to find the right balance between third-person and first-person. First we had to find rules that were there to be followed, but also know when they were there to be broken. Things like focusing on the DPS and the team fight to get more action, but being cognizant of alt usage so that the storyline of the fight can be told. There was much trial and error, and some stuff didn't work, but a lot of it did, and we honed it throughout the event. And then after we were, told, we were brought out to Blizzard HQ and had to teach their observing team what we'd done so they could take it and use it for Overwatch League, which they then ruined. Um, the other thing is pacing. So you can be quick, you can be slow. You've got to have the right speed, the right tone for what you're trying to convey. One of the stylistic choices I make is at the end of a show, if you're in a stadium and a team has won, you have that hype moment of the caster shouting, and, and here are your champions. And then we bring their mics down and we bring the music up. We have a sweeping shot of the talent, uh, we have a sweeping shot of the players and then a sweeping shot of the audience. And we let the moment sit. We slow down to elevate the moment. We could keep up, we could have James Bardolph screaming at the top of his lungs, but it's not needed. The story is, is much richer by just seeing the players' jubilation at lifting their trophy with some pretty chill music as you sweep through the audience. However, the most important and the area that gives us the absolute most creative freedom is content. We do so much content, some of which Simon's going to talk you through. Yeah. So, um, in my opinion, without content, um, broadcast can often feel kind of garden variety. You may as well just stick the game on, stick some commentary over it, and let it sit. Uh, have a couple of stats pop up every now and then and maybe some highlights. But content is where you really get to tell the story of an entire event. Um, so things like the videography that you use, the graphics that you use to supplement that content. So when you have a player talking about his run in an event like Flashpoint, having the statistics below that show that he's actually done really well and he's not just you know, lying about his performance, it's really important. Uh, but also conveying the gravity of what that event means in the wider scope of things. So is it a qualification to a major? Uh, does it really not matter because it's some online event for 50K? Um, will it change that person's life because if they win, their team gets a million dollars and he can bring his family out of poverty? That, that happens in esports and that's pretty awesome to see. And it's something that we, we kind of take um, a cue from regular sports from because esports can lift people out of situations that are pretty awful. Um, but yeah, I think content is the, the, best, uh, the best way to show that off. And for a viewer that tunes into a stream, if you open up Twitch or YouTube and you, you jump on a show and it's just the game playing and that's it, trying to find context to that event is really difficult if you can't go onto YouTube and search for, for content that explains what the event is, that explains who the players are, who the teams are, why this event matters in the wider context of the game that they're playing. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, that's why, uh, as much as we can, at, at specifically at Face It, we put a lot of effort into producing content, but not just content that's heavy and dark and explains why this is so important for everybody to, to be focusing on, but also that's funny and light and shows off at the end of the day, it's a game, right? And people take it really seriously. We build our careers on these games. Uh, and you know, it's kind of funny being, uh, an entertainment product on an entertainment product. But for these players, it's, it's their whole life. And making light of that is, is uh, something that I think we excel at. Um, but yeah, um, I think that um, you know, after seeing those Flashpoint 2 videos, there's a lot of logistics in the background that, that come to light without people ever noticing what's going to happen. So we had that, that massive stage shot. And I'll, I'll 
go back in the, the um, I'll actually go back in the presentation and show you, but this was our studio stage in Flashpoint. It had a RoboCam track that went across the front of it, our analyst desk where we had the host and two casters, and everybody was separated because it was COVID, right? So we didn't want them standing really close together. So this is actually a two meter gap between them, and that's about four or five meters between the host and them to make sure that they weren't mixing in a way that was gonna get them uh, sick if one of us caught COVID somehow in this bubble. And then off to the right, there's the cast desk. But um, the logistics of getting that together um, and then producing content in a space where that, that was live for eight hours a day. Uh, off to the, the side of here where you can't see it, there was a green, like a massive five by five meter green screen where all of that content was shot. And in the morning and the evening when the show wasn't live, that's where all of those videos were recorded. Um, but we, you know, there's four people in a film crew that were working on it. There were probably 20 people working on the live broadcast of this at any one time. And a lot of the guys were up in their hotel rooms isolating. So we had to move their audio desks, TVs, networking panels, comms boxes, all sorts of stuff up there. Uh, and one of my fondest memories is taking fiber optic cable through an elevator shaft. So we, from the bottom, this is on the ground floor. And if you can imagine Twickenham, there were three stories that we were working on and the hotel is attached. We literally ran hundreds of meters of fiber optic cable through elevator shafts that they had to stop all of us sitting in hivers and, and harnesses and these elevator shafts making sure we weren't bending the cables just to make sure that our crew could run it because we weren't allowed by the government to bring anyone else in to do their jobs. And a lot of them couldn't be replaced because they were unique to the sound design, the stage design, the camera operation. Um, and I, I guess that kind of marks perfectly what Reese is gonna talk about next, which is the uh, kind of logistics behind executing the tier one broadcast. Top right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to talk through everything that goes into an event as a producer, because I'm sure there's some aspects that you wouldn't even consider that are required. So to start, you can have the event plan. This is your skeleton. This is everything that's needed. This may come as part of an RFP or something you pitched for. It will have the scope, the dates, you have to identify potential issues and build that skeleton that you can keep coming back to week after week, day after day, and everyone can then flesh out throughout the entire process. Next up will be the site visit. So that's where you, you pick out a bunch of locations where you might want to, a few stadiums that you might want to use, and you go and you do a full walk around and figure out what the technical limitations are, what this, this space has that others don't, and why you might pick this place over another. And you, you need to visualize lots of issues that may not be apparent, but you have to see them ahead of time because if they pop up when you've already picked here, it's your job to fix them. The next would be stage mockups. So these would start off simple. Um, we usually build them in like paint. Um, they look terrible, but you visually get across what you want, how that stage should be, why it should be, how thick are the LED walls? What's the spacing gonna be like? And then you'd send that over to someone to make 3D designs for, that would then be used for the actual production people to put together. The next is technical logistics, which Simon, do you wanna, do you wanna take? Yeah, so uh, like I said, with, with pulling fiber off the cable through a, an elevator shop, which is a pretty unusual situation that we'd have to do normally, it's really nicely planned. Um, the, the tech can be anything from understanding how much power you need going into a, a space. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, how much power you need going into a space, uh, how much network capacity you need. So in, interestingly, we have a, we have a studio uh, in South London and one of the biggest limitations is the upload speed on that studio. And um, without planning out something as simple as the fiber uh, networking that you have for a show, you could run into problems where you work with international partners where you have to send out 17. Ooh, sorry, why is there feedback on that? It's awful. Um, yeah, without understanding like how you're gonna push out 17 international partner feeds without completely killing your upload. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe you wanna walk out to the front of it? Huh? Yeah, I don't know if it's me standing on the wrong side of the stage, but is that better? Yeah, yeah probably. sorry guys. 
Um, yeah. So anyway, thinking about the tech and planning and logistics and things. And sorry, guys, for throwing you under the bus at the back over there because you've been great. Um, every single thing that you can think of from making sure that you have enough monitors for the crew that you need. Uh, like we had 20 people sitting in the gallery at Flashpoint. Uh, every one of them needed at least two monitors and we, we packed, I think it was 60 monitors for enough of them just to be able to have replays, highlights, run of show, uh, the program feed of the entire, the entire show. It's really important that everyone has the resources they need. Um, and like I said, planning is such a massive part of running a good show. Um, so, and it's, it, there's been times where we haven't had enough of what we needed and we've had to make do. And we've done pretty well with that. But um, down to something that you may be involved with on a smaller, smaller broadcast in a room like this or from a home, home setup, um, often the, you won't be able to Google these things, right? You can't ask, like, how much bandwidth do I need to be able to run 17 streams at once or... Um, you know, what type of connection do I need for all of these mics that we've been given from a, from a team that we don't know, or will my cameras work as part of the setup? And again, working with the right people and the right teams is really important to get that right. And to add into that, the next thing would be, would be budgeting. So you need all of these things. You need to know ahead of time how much everything costs. You can't go out and, and ask uh, how much get a quote and then put that into the budget. The budget needs to exist beforehand. How much is a replay operator going to cost? You need to know that ahead of talking to the replay operator. So during negotiations, you don't go, up, go above a certain level. That budget is going to get pushed back and pushed back. So you need to be able to, even after creating the budget, allocate areas to cut back ways to reduce costs. Because esports is, is big, but it still isn't very profitable. And there's always cuts everywhere. Next thing to tie into that would be crewing. So you need to know all the, all the crew you need for a show. Who are they? Where are you going to get them from? You need to have those neg negotiations with people. Get them within budget. Make sure that everyone's going to work well together. Allocate how that team is going to work together. What are the sub-teams within your team? You need to put all of that together uh, way ahead of time. The next would be creating the run of show. So that's your, your manual for how the entire event is going to run. Uh, we use software called Showflow, which we then have uh, screens to track. So throughout the gallery, there will be a follow of the producer to Showflow. And every time, uh, every time we move down an item that the producer and the director are taking us through, the, the Showflow will, will track us through. That will have everything from um, talent notes to lighting cues to graphics cues you name it, everything has to be in there because everyone needs to follow the run of show to be able to run the broadcast effectively. <clears throat> uh, the next will be for that talent procurement. So it's the same as the crew, but it's almost more important. Talent are usually quite difficult and they can be, there's lots that are huge divas. They won't work with certain people. They work best with other people. You need to be able to work with your talent, hire the right talent, and get the most out of them, because good talent can make or break a broadcast. The next thing would be contracts, which is the fun part. Uh, paperwork is awful, but you have to do it. Um, so that's contracts for crew, contacts for talent, maybe NDAs. That's um, for logistics companies. They, they all need contracts. They all need payment terms. And usually the producer does a bulk of those, if not all of them. You have to work with the graphics team to make sure that your run of show has all the graphics you need and they, you work with that team to make sure that their time is allocated. You have enough, enough people at enough time to hit certain deadlines. You can take input from multiple people to elevate the broadcasts and make sure you have the right people to do what you need so that when you call for a graphic, it doesn't look different to what a talent has asked for. Similarly, it'll be content creation. Um, we'll have lots, lots of meetings. We'll have a content plan throughout the event, but that will definitely evolve. You need to rely on as many people as you can to get the, the most out of it. Often with a show, I might have a, a team of 50 people under me, and you need to make sure you get everything you can out of all those people to get the best product you can. Sound design. Um, it's something that often gets overlooked, but sound is very integral in the tone of the show. 
that's from music uh, to play during the breaks to to winning music to the opening theme everything will affect how the viewer feels with what's going on screen if you have a play end and a huge play happens and then the replay happens with nothing on it it's much less impactful than if you have a, a track playing some light rock music that just gives that play a little a little polish and, and makes it feel better and actually before you skip on that if any of you guys uh, end up working on a show in the in the not too distant future please don't use NCS music from YouTube there are so many better things that you can do to, to pick out awesome music that fits the theme of your show and I think like we said if you if you aren't tailoring the theme of your music so the, my best example is I worked on the Rainbow Six Latin American broadcast in English and all of the music was themed as Latin American or Spanish um, and that doesn't mean that it's like the typical stereotype of, of what people think of that music, but it, it gave the entire show a sense of difference. So even though you're watching it in Europe or you're watching it in America, you really felt part of that Brazilian show that we were trying to put on. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it actually made a massive difference between moments feeling like any other generic Rainbow Six broadcast and feeling like this show had an identity. Following on from that would be working with external partners. So. Senior people all want to have an input in what you're doing. Um, quite often you can't say no to that. You may have to say no, and if you have to say no, you have to play the politics and figure out how to say no or to give, to give uh, someone a little bit without affecting the broadcast that makes them feel happy and involved. It also means that you work with uh, sponsors. You need to make sure that everything they want is included whether that be course selection, whether that be talent readouts, whether that be um, physical logos on set. There's so many different things it can entail and you need to make sure nothing is missed because if, it miss, if it's missed, it's on your head, even if you didn't do it. As the producer, you're in charge and if anything goes wrong, it's your fault, even if it isn't your fault. And you'll have to apologize for it and make it right. So that means being on top of your entire team to make sure that no one messes up because if anyone messes up, you messed up. This is before you even actually get to the event. The first day would be the setup day, which is you're arriving at the, arriving at the event and you're building. Build, build, build. This may be on the tech side, um, which Simon's usually involved in, or on my side, it might be more meetings and, and briefings. It could be anything, um, but the important part is that wherever anyone needs help, you help. Whether you're the director of broadcasting, whether you're an intern, you know, get under a table and start plugging in cables because we never have enough bodies and esports is always understaffed. So everyone needs to kind of muck in and, and do their part. After this would usually be the media day. So from this, we need, you often need uh, photographic headshots, hero shots uh, through, from videography, interviews, comedy pieces, drone shots, press conferences, and honestly, as many things as you can fit into the day. You need to come up with the logistics of this from what crew do we need? What uh, tech do they need? Do we need licensing to film outside of the venue? Um, all of these things have to come in. Like, what is the schedule? The players are going to complain if you keep them for more than an hour. So how do you fit everything you need into that time? And before you, you, you know. move on from that, specifically with Media Days, what I found is that if you can make your pieces reusable, so you can take the same piece of content, the same headshot, the same interview and reuse it over and over and over again. It, you know, say you've done an interview with a team for an hour and you can get four hours of content out of that, which is normally not the case. It's only about two minutes. But uh, whatever you can pull out of that day that's more valuable, don't be afraid to reuse that content because normally viewers don't notice. And if they do, they're not going to comment on it. The next thing would be briefings and meetings. So you may be, you need to be prepared to talk in front of a room of 50 to 100 people who all need something from you. Everyone needs something different and you need to address all of those needs and, and fix them. Many of them you may not be able to fix. You may have no idea how to resolve them, but you need to come up with a solution because no one else will. It all falls on your shoulders. Then you get to the live days. So if you're an executive producer, you might be running around putting out fires and schmoozing people. Um, you'll talk all day, maybe you'll give a, a tour, perhaps you'll be sprinting down to the gallery to complain that a sponsor deliverable has been missed. If you're a live producer, then you're tied to the desk. Yourself and the director are, are running the ship, so everything relies on you 
and nothing can go wrong. Following that is the teardown. So it's exactly the same as a setup day, but in a third of the time. So you are taking everything apart, putting in boxes. While senior executives and players and talent are in the bar celebrating, you're under a crate unplugging things. You'll probably get to the bar about 4 a.m., um, which is when the real party starts anyway. After the event is finished, you're still not done. Uh, you need to start creating reports, viewership reports. How did the event go? What's everyone's feedback? What should we do next time? What can we learn from the event? What do we need to not do again? Which areas need improving? You may need to create KPI reports for your full-time staff on whether they're hitting targets. This can take weeks after the event. So really, even though an event might only be two days, you're probably working on it for six months. And honestly, there's, there's plenty more that I have not included that you'll have to come up with, that, that will come up and you have to be prepared to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and then, Simon, do you want to take over for practical skills? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I found, uh, and I'm going to talk in vague terms because the specifics of the practical skills that you need to do um, or have at hand are ultimately incredibly varied. Obviously, not everyone in this room wants to do what we do. A lot of you may want to be involved in the planning of things. You may want to go into the games industry. You may want to go into the music industry. I'm not entirely sure what each of you has planned. Um, but I think that these skills transfer across all fields. And again, looking at getting a job in a world where, especially in this industry, it's incredibly competitive. Um, if I can think off the top of my head, just to face it, there are only four producers that do all, our, all of our events. There's me and recent, and the other two of us sit in the US. Um, and at ESL, I think there are about 20 kind of scattered all over the place. And they, they have you know a billion dollars worth of events going on. So uh, it's, it's, it's tight. Um, and you know, I, I think back to video engineers, audio engineers, replay operators and things. There's not hundreds of people that we have floating around in a catalog of, uh, of employability. It's a small, small set of people. Um, but the skills that I think you really need is obviously the theoretical knowledge of whatever field you're working in. So for us, it's, it's the run of show. It's how to plan an event. It's how you know, the creative direction of things we want to feel. But you know, if you're a replay operator, uh, it may be understanding when to put those, those replay ups, how long they should be, how they need to end, what feel they need to convey. And someone may not be telling you what they want from you. Uh, and then obviously the practical knowledge is incredibly, incredibly important in this field. So being able to get your hands dirty, both literally and figuratively, um, whether that's just trying to understand your job in relation to everyone else's and how you can make other people's lives easier. And ultimately that's what's gonna make you more employable. If people don't have to ask you a bunch of questions or chase you up, you're gonna be a more valuable asset than the person that has to constantly be asked, where's my replay, where's this content? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and then, obviously, in, in esports specifically for us, it's a deep understanding of the game and its community. So I'm I'm not a particular league fan or Valorant fan, but whenever we we get asked to to consider working on a show like that or Rocket League or or anything else that we've worked on, um, it's browsing Reddit, browsing Twitter, looking at articles that that other um, media outlets have put out about that game to understand like what's the feeling around the game? Do people hate the current patch? Do people feel like that the meta in that game is completely out of whack? Um, are they really in love with a certain talent? And if we don't have them on our broadcast, are we gonna get absolutely roasted for not bringing them on? Which happens a lot more often than you'd think. Um, and, and figuring that out, again, in whatever field you're in. So if people hate rock music in the CSGO scene, which is not true, but if that was the case and you as the audio engineer said, oh yeah, I'm gonna put an entire rock playlist together, the event's gonna get a lot of flack for that. So really understanding your audience is super key. Um, and that doesn't just go down to producers, it's kind of any job in, in this industry. Uh, but that's not a prerequisite. So you don't have to be a Siege player or a CSGO or a League or whatever player to, to actually get into that, that uh, field. You can do the research, um, you can even ask, I mean, the, the best resources that I find are often the, the commentators or the casters or the hosts in that field because they want to talk their, your ear off about their game, right? And 
if you ask like how can we make this better, how can we like really pander to the audience, they'll be the best ones to tell you, uh, and you'll be better off for it. Um, and then again, what we've touched on it over and over again, but I don't think it can be stated enough, is that jack of all trades approach. So you don't have to be a pro at everything. I mean, I'm definitely not an audio engineer. I'm definitely not the best stage manager that there is in the world. But when the opportunity comes up and, and you kind of say, yeah, I'm, I'll try, I'll give it a go. Um, and being open to learning those skills, even if you don't want to make it your career. Like I'm, I don't want to be a stage manager for the rest of my life, but doing it at a couple of events has taught me a whole bunch of skills that eventually as a producer, I get to treat stage managers better, give them the resources that they need to do their job better. Um, and ultimately it'll make you a, a more rounded person. Um, and then ultimately, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with not having arrogance, but understanding that broadcast, no matter what you do, stage events, live events, uh, all of it is being part of a team. It's a team sport. And understanding that you can't be an eye specialist. Like, uh, the show isn't me. I don't win the award. I don't uh, put on the show. I don't make 100,000 viewers tune in. It's 40, 50, 60 people that put that show on. And maybe at a smaller scale it's four people that put on a twitch broadcast or you know a small stage event but making everybody feel like they're part of a team and giving people that that validity and responsibility will ultimately make you a better team player and whatever show that you're doing better um, and then yeah I'm I'm just gonna let Reese kind of uh, talk about his his experience of what being a producer is and yeah what it takes don't worry we're almost done so i just kind of wanted to summarize with what a producer is and a producer is kind of many things you need to be the brain of the production you need to make sure that everyone has everything they need when they need it you need to fix or what's fix every problem even if you haven't got a clue of how to fix it You'll be the first one in every morning and you'll probably be the last one to leave. You may have to finish while everyone else goes to the bar and sit alone in your hotel room updating the run of show for tomorrow. You'll travel the world but probably only ever see the inside of a, a venue or a hotel. But most importantly, you get the ability to wake up and go to work not knowing what the day will bring. I've never had two days at Face It that have been the same and I've never felt that chore of having to go to work. I get to go to work and I get to enjoy what I do. Closing lines? Yeah. Um, so again, like I said, you may not want to be a producer or a director, um, but whatever you ultimately want to do with your career depends on getting your foot in the door early on. Uh, volunteering as much as a lot of, you know, I, I think the industry gladly and a lot of the working world is moving away from unpaid volunteering uh, and unpaid internships. Um, but if, if the opportunity arises and you get a chance to, to go onto those shows and yeah, it's not gonna, not gonna you know, make ends meet for you, but if it gets a great connection, a good, a good networking opportunity or teaches you skills that you may not have had the, the opportunity to learn before, just go for it. Um, I never really thought or, or dreamed until much more recently that I would produce or direct a big show. Uh, and every time I get to put on the headset and, and speak to the crew that I work with, um, I know that the people in that room are really passionate about what they do because if a lot of the people that work on that, if they wanted to make more money or if they wanted to have a more casual lifestyle, would probably work in traditional media or another job. Um, but we all are there because esports is almost like the Wild West, but a lot of it is, it's, it's getting more professional. It's becoming something that's actually really respectable to work in. Um, but just understand that you need to learn a lot. Uh, I'm only 24, but I, you know, I feel like I've been given a tremendous amount of responsibility with the broadcasts that I've done because I've listened. Um, and as long as you work as hard as you feel like you can output and you're proud of what you're putting out uh, in a show, no matter what position you're in, you'll succeed. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks again for coming this morning. Um, I hope that's given you a little bit of insight into what it takes to kind of execute a broadcast. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, we'll host a Q&A session now, but thank you for your time. Uh, and for anybody, if, you're, if you don't want to ask the question in front of 
the whole audience. We'll, we'll be around for a little bit afterwards so you can ask us directly. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really awesome. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, I hope you guys did too. Uh, let's see some hands in the air for some questions. Owen, <laughs> I knew you'd have them. Um, so, obviously, with the BR6 English broadcast, obviously, Ubisoft obviously haven't decided to redo it this year in English. How yeah. has that affected your guys in terms of has it made you feel a bit more down, or is it just basically a Ubisoft decision that doesn't really have any impact on you? I mean, obviously, it has impact. So, uh, I mean, I, so I've run this for the last 18 months. I've been the one that, that produced the show um, with a few, like a, t a talent roster that's rotated, obviously. Uh, it has an impact, obviously, financially, it takes away a show that we do all year, and it means that all the people that are freelancers that work on that show don't have that recurring uh, work from us. Um, luckily, we'll be able to use replay operators and, and other people that we have on the show on other products that come up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's never easy. Uh, ultimately, doing white label products, which is what we do a majority of the time now, uh, you're at the whim of the client, and Ubisoft decided that they um, weren't going to go ahead with it for a number of their own business reasons. But um, you know, it frees me up to do other shows. Um, it, it gives talent the opportunity to probably find other, other doors and other games. Maybe they'll have to pivot. Um, but yeah, ultimately, we just have to roll with the punches. I would say don't, you can never get too attached to a product because they can go away overnight. Yeah. Um, there's lots of, I mean, ECS was a product that I loved for four years. It doesn't exist anymore. And you just have to accept that it's a, it's a product and it's there to make money. And if someone deems it not making enough money, it'll disappear. Yeah. Cool. might be a little bit uh, out of your department, but as like face it representatives, what do you think of the current state of uh, FPL? Of FPL? Mm -hmm. You want to talk about it? Um, if, you don't, yeah. if, you don't, if you don't know that's fine. It's yeah, I, I kind of, for the first few years, I kept up with the platform, but uh, now I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, so in face it, and again, it's probably like any, any company that grows, we're part of the media team, mm -hmm. and the platform side of the company handles a lot of other different things. So when we're running content, media events, and tournament or operation, uh, the FPL has its own team that runs runs everything. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of out of our wheelhouse. Yeah, we're we're, we're very separate. The Face It main office is, uh, you know, a hundred developers sat quietly coding. Our office is uh, Smash Bros tournaments in front of a giant projector, so <laughs> it's very different. Um, part, what's, uh, what's Thorin really like? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. Cool. Any other questions? Alex. Cool. Um, so a large part of this talk's been on building up a narrative for your events. Um, if you've got a really small scale event compared to what you put on and you don't have the means to really prepare kind of video content interviews and things like that, um, what's the best way to really put out a good narrative for the audience? Obviously, you mentioned music and graphics. Yeah. Is there anything else you can recommend for elevating it? Yeah, so I mean, I've, I find that working with talent, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, so, so you'll have a couple of people, and obviously, if you don't have budget and you can't pay them for a, a whole length of time or content days and bits and pieces, um, one of the coolest things that I think we did, it was called the A to Z of Siege. Um, and it, it was zero budget. We took time on the live days um, where we had, you know, I mean, some of the show days I knew would only be six hours. So we had two hours of time to do content with talent. Um, and we would, I would write a script together. And then one of our talent, like Ace or Jackie, would uh, quickly do a voice recording of it. And then using, you know, GT title designer or, after Effects or Photoshop, we put together small bits of graphic package that just had voiceovers. Um, and again, that, that was time consuming for me because I, I've, you know, I'm not part of the budget consideration of things or the time consideration of things. Uh, and those are small things that you can do. So small scripts, voice recordings, graphics, um, but also 
a lot of the time I find community insight. So if you're trying to tell a narrative about a team, uh, teams will try really hard to promote themselves on social media. They may have very vocal fans. So you can pull up tweets, you can pull up Reddit comments, and you can have you know, talent or anybody that's on your show discuss it. And that kind of fills a lot of time. But it's tricky. It's really hard. If you don't have a budget to do things, you don't have the, the means to film a lot of stuff, it, it, can be, it can be tough. But even, I mean, you know, if you're not having tens of thousands of people view your broadcast, uh, an iPhone recorded video with some slapdash editing is much better than nothing. Yeah. I would say, ironically, the lower broadcast, uh, sorry, the lower broadcast in terms of budget, the more effort the talent will put in. Um, a talent getting paid 200 pounds a day generally puts in more work than a talent being paid 5,000 pounds a day. Shouldn't be the case, but it is. So you can lean heavily on, on the people you have because they're as hungry as you. They want the work. They want this to be the best they can because they're trying to put on a showcase of themselves. Yeah. Cool. Um, aside from running network cables through a liquor shaft, what's the most wacky solution you've had to a problem? Ooh, Te a technical problem or anything. Yeah. A technical problem. That's it. Uh, this is for me at, at Epic Land, so it was before my face at time, but uh, basically our, we had one, one tiny little DSLR camera, one computer running both the observing and the production, um, and our, um, our splitter for our mics broke. So we, we brought in the mics through an aux jack onto the laptop and then daisy chained HDMI cables to the speaker system to try and make them work. <laughs> Um, it was awful, the quality was pretty terrible, but the commentary went on. Um, I'm trying to think what, and if there's anything else that's wacky. For, for me, it would be um, back for Face It League season one. <clears throat> we did the event in our office in London, and on the last day, James Baldolf ended up opening Skype, and we got DDoSed as a result. <laughs> so we had 350,000 concurrent viewers about to start the finals, and we had no backup connection, so we had no way of running the event. We ended up finishing the event on a phone, so we had to basically just get the connection from that phone, which was an unlimited connection. He didn't agree, um, but we managed to finish it off, and uh, yeah, without a hitch, I guess. Yep, yeah, literally just a phone data. Um, oh, How much did the phone <laughs> um, I think it's all right. I mean, the, the entire gallery was, again, the size of this stage. So there was about seven of us in there. So you couldn't have told anyway. It was a, a sauna. <laughs> it smelled pretty ripe in there. <laughs> the, um, maybe one of the funnier ones. So in Jan of 2020, uh, obviously, sorry, 2021, when the pandemic was kind of in full swing and lockdowns were all of a thing, I went home to visit my family in South Africa and they red listed the country, so I couldn't come back without isolating. And I, uh, I ran all of the audio and networking off of my laptop on the other side of the planet when the team was in London. Um, and I kind of had, uh, had to jerry-rig a network cable that was like 40 meters long from our tiny little router in the lounge all the way across the house with my mom shouting at me every day for tripping over it. Um, but yeah, there's been, there's been some interesting times in COVID. And then I guess, you know, some funny stories from Flashpoint where there's 42 of you in a bubble for eight weeks um, going a little crazy. Yeah, I'd say that the Flashpoint 2 was probably the most creative in that we had a COVID outbreak two days before the end, which meant that all but about four people out of the 42 were allowed to leave their room. Um, sorry, were not allowed to leave their room. So the four people had to then ship up equipment to outside of their hotel rooms, and then we had to build everyone's individual s setup within their rooms. So I was producing from the hotel monitor um, and then a bunch of PCs that were just delivered. And then we had to connect all of that over the hotel's internet um, and then pull feeds from the talent who are still in the studio. Um, yeah, it was, it was a mess. <laughs> but, you know, we pulled that off within 24 hours. And they're the kind of things, we're not traditional, we're not traditional media. We don't have 50 engineers who you can click your finger and fix it. So you just have to be ready to take whatever is going to hit you. Yeah.
Um, any other favourite projects that you've worked on apart from Flashpoint 2, like, for example, EUL, Finals, etc.? Yeah, I mean, again, throughout this, like, most of my experience has been through COVID, so it's been a lot of remote products. So the, the only actual studio events that I've worked on is Flashpoint in Twickenham and then the, the Mexico Major. Um, I think the Mexico Major was my favourite event because we, uh, I, was, I was actually in Mexico for a month I was there two weeks before the, the show started and we had to navigate getting camera operators, rigging crews, all of the set design and, and build done uh, in a country we didn't speak the same language. Um, and also it, it was peak film season in Mexico City at the time. So all of, a lot of the companies, the rigging crews, camera operators, like the good ones were, were taken up. Um, so we had to kind of just make a plan. Uh, we shipped all of our equipment from LA. So in three 24 foot trucks, across the border down to Mexico City and we took the entire Hilton in, um, in Mexico City up. So we had 150 hotel rooms. Um, we had their entire, they have a, like a ballroom uh, that's normally split in three. We took down all the walls between them, like those dividing walls and used the entire space uh, and built a stage inside a hotel. Uh, and then our gallery was across it in the other smaller conference rooms, kind of like three of this size. Um, it was awesome for me because um, basically there was supposed to be a B stream and everyone is supposed to be on site for that. But the UK red listed Mexico two weeks into me being there, um, which meant that none of our talent could come and a lot of our crew uh, had to be given the tough decision of like, do you come or do you do not and have to risk the quarantine um, or get COVID possibly, right? So a lot of people opted to stay back home. Uh, so we did, I mean, Reese was my producer on the, on the show while I was directing it, and he was on TeamSpeak, like directing the, you know, producing the show. All of the talent were at home. We pulled them in through the mix calls. Um, but my broadcast gallery was right next to the other one, so we were constantly throwing back and forth between the two. Um, and uh, I'll actually, well, if you ask any other questions, I'll grab a video up to kind of show you what the what the gallery looked like because it's it's pretty cool. I'd say for me, probably the uh, E-League Major. Um, it was a sort of a brilliant event. It was great working with traditional media to show what they can do. And on top of that, uh, I got paid traditional media rates. So I billed 23 days at $1,500 a day. So it was a pretty good month. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, it was, it was a kind of eye-opening to show how we deal with it and what they can throw at it. I'm just going to disconnect so I don't blare the speakers out while I find this thing. Any more questions? How does, um, so how would the start of a project happen? Could you like run us through that with, in terms of would you come up with the project and pitch it to a company? Or would a company say, hey, we want you to run our project. Can you think it up? So if it's an internal project, usually it's either coming because we've been, someone from the top of our company decides they want something. We've had a few products that I've pitched and I've come up with a design and then we've gone through. If it's an external project, it usually comes from an RFP, which is a request for pitch. So they will say, we want this game around this period and it has to do this, these things. And then you'll be asked to then pitch and come up with something that, that fits that brief. But they'll send it out to a bunch of different production companies. So you'll be competing with Starladder, Blast, ESL, and it can come down to whoever is the lowest, but there can be lots of different variant factors to decide who they go with. So uh, earlier you touched upon that you merged with ESL, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have done performance and events with them since then, uh, have you seen an uh, improvement uh, with quality? We haven't officially merged with them yet. Uh, I think there's a couple of months until that goes through. So we're really kind of unsure how that's going to be. Um, there's definitely probably going to be some collaborative events going forward, but at least for the meantime, it's expected that we remain separate entities and we continue doing our own thing. Um, our team will focus on Ubisoft, the Global Esports Tour, um, things like that, while ESL does whatever they do. Um, I think we'll kind of lean on each other going forward if we do get more collaborative. 
they don't have much of a presence in the US, whereas we've got a, a big facility in Culver City in, in California. Um, we've kind of scaled back in Europe. So I think, like me and Simon, will end up going to Stockholm and Berlin and Katowice more, um, yeah. and th there will be more of them leaning on us to use our LA studio. Yeah. Cool. Any last questions? Nope. Um, really? Cool. Is that no, no one else? <laughs> Um, I've got a question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned Showflow earlier. There's mm -hmm. a piece of yeah. software used for production rundown. Um, is there any uh, other software or tools um, you would recommend that are like absolutely vital to your productions that we might not have heard of? Um, so for our graphic software, um, we use Expression now. Um, but we used to use Casper CG. Um, I actually much preferred Casper CG. It's much harder to use uh, because you have to it's open source, so you have to learn how it works and just use tutorials. But because it's open source, there's a lot more you can do with it. So I would say for a lot of shows, when you're scaling up after vMix, you're not going to be able to afford an expression license. Casper CG is free, so yeah. it's a great skill to, to learn that software. Um, it does video playout and graphic playout, uh, and then you can get a lot of plugins for it. You can write your own code for it. There's a lot, lot you can do with it. Yeah. And what about you? In terms of software, um, I mean, obviously, I, I'm sure that it's come up in conversation. But for if you want to be involved in audio, Dante Audio Networking is just about the industry standard for what we use. It's audio over network, um, and I found that that has saved us a lot of time in trying instead of running tons of audio cables through stuff. We just have a network set up, and we can bring in as many things as we need to. A lot of the time, it also involves. Uh, so we use vMix calls often for remote interviews and talent and player cams and things. And bringing audio over Dante instead of running you know, two to five cables for each PC or machine that we've had to bring was, was really changed, changed it for me. And I wish myself that I knew how to actually set up a Dante network. So that's, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Any last thoughts before we go? Yeah, one more, squeeze it, one more. Okay. That's a bit more of a personal question. Do you each have a favorite caster to work with? Ooh. Um, mine's, I mean, Jackie, who spoke here the other day, is one of my favorite favorites to work with. Um, but also uh, Desitu, uh, who, who's the EOR host, he's probably one of my, my favorite guys to work with as well. I mean, there's a myriad. I'm obviously more like Rainbow Six centric, uh, so I, I love a lot of the talent that work on that. Ace, Jackie, Des uh, are all great people. The American side of stuff, they're also like great fun to work with. Yeah, I'd say I've given Jackie a lot of work over the years. He's a good guy to, to work with and also hang out with. Uh, and then James Bardolph and DDK, I also spent six years working with. We lived together in LA and, and they're great to work with. But I also kind of like working with new talent, um, constantly looking for new people. Freya Spears was, was one who in ECS season four, we ran a talent competition that she entered. And then within a year, she was stage hosting ECS. Um, you know, within three or four years, she's like the face of Counter-Strike. So I think, yeah, there's, there's loads of people I like working with, but I always like working with new people who can show what they've got. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, another big round of applause, please, for Simon Reese. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, we'll hang around a bit if anyone wants to ask anything one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and don't forget, so take a break now. Um, stick around and ask some questions if you want to, one-to-one. -to -one. Um, the next uh, event is at 12 o'clock uh, with JD Wu. So take a little break and be back then, 12 o'clock sharp. Cheers, guys.